Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to, to, to add my thanks to UNC Chapel Hill for hosting us. We're here to be able to be here in the not sunny but ever beautiful Chapel Hill area. And this presentation today is, is one of a calendar of events in OCLC's Collective Insight Series, programming that highlights the value realized from the OCLC Cooperative's collective work. Today's presentation is the first in the Collective Insight Series to highlight academic work facilitated by OCLC's ongoing program of providing that data to scholars. In this presentation, one such scholar will present his recent work exploring how social science maps the work, um, work that leverages in part data from WorldCat. Our presenter is Charles Kurzman, a professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and co-director of the Carolina Center for the Study of Middle East and Muslim Civilizations. His primary focus is Middle East and Islamic Studies, and his most recently published book is See Martyrs, Why There Are So Few Muslim Terrorists. With that, may I introduce uh, Dr. Kurzman. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is Charlie Kurzman. Uh, Speaking to you from the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Thank you all, uh, you folks who've come out today. Thank you to uh, also to those of you joining us uh, over the internet. And a special thanks to the OCLC for arranging this. I've been working now with, for a couple of years uh, with Eric Childress and his colleagues at uh, OCLC on uh, uh, obtaining WorldCat uh, bibliographic records and studying them. I'm going to put that uh, uh, work uh, to you today. And uh, I've really been thrilled to, to see the level of uh, uh, collaborativeness and enthusiasm uh, from the OCLC and, and from uh, other folks in the library community uh, helping me to both uh, get access to data for this kind of research and also uh, what to do with it once I've gotten access to it because as I'm learning, it is a whole new language uh, and even a way of thinking that I, as a, a sociologist, hadn't, uh, hadn't encountered. And I'm struck by the insight that, that all this big data stuff that we hear so much about in the social sciences, well, librarians have been doing this for ages. Librarians had big data for ages and managing it and building in a way that's useful and that is uh, uh, scalable uh, is something that I think we in the social sciences have a lot to learn from librarian personnel. Uh, I'd like to uh, jump in. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to forward my slide here. Uh, click your mouse inside the slide area, and then you'll be able to advance them with the upper arrow. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. That was easy. Terrific. Uh, the topic is uh, scholarly attention to different regions of the world. How how social science in the United States maps the world, and we hear a distorted map of the world uh, that is one snapshot of the way in which scholarship in the U.S. tends to focus disproportionately on the United States and less than we would expect in terms of population uh, uh, or uh, indicators on other regions of the world. I'd like to uh, uh, go uh, some data that describes this and that looks at how, over the last 50 years, these patterns have changed or not changed. As an introduction, like this, the broader challenge of globalizing higher education in the United States, of taking it away from um, were originally quite parochial roots in the study of oneself, of one's own culture, one's own national history, one's own religious traditions, and so on. Uh, an education that both is uh, reflects and prepares us for uh, our globalized world. One of the points for this uh, uh, study and for the national attention to this issue comes in the National Defense Act of 1958. So over a half century ago, the U.S. Congress, uh, being uh, with strong encouragement from the Eisenhower administration, passes this piece of legislation that for the first time put the federal government into uh, higher education. Uh, higher education in the U.S., unlike almost every other country in the world, is really a private enterprise. Uh, it, there are public universities, of course, but it's so decentralized, the federal government had not historically played much of a role at all in education systems in the U.S. This uh, act 
starts to bring the federal government into this area. And it was really a Cold War piece of legislation. The present emergency, as you can see at the bottom, the present emergency, meaning the Cold War and the threat of what seemed to be uh, startling scientific uh, advances by the Soviet Union, including uh, 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 space uh, uh, and other forms of, of uh, scientific endeavor, present emergency, I mean, the U.S. has to keep up demands that additional, more adequate educational opportunities be made available. And among the list of items that they were focusing on, and I've put it in gray there, is modern foreign languages. We needed to prepare more people in modern foreign languages, unspoken, but part of the legislative history was so that we'd have more specialists to study parts of the world that we were fighting against or we were preparing to potentially fight against uh, in the future, that this was really a uh, clearly uh, national security imperative from their perspective. Some of this, uh, uh, one of many results, was building a cadre of international and area studies centers around the United States that teach less commonly taught foreign languages, where they would subsidize the instruction in uh, uh, a number of areas of the world so that we'd have more specialists who would know more uh, about these regions after graduation, perhaps serving in government. This is the Title VI program. And Title VI, uh, once again, under threat, uh, constant high uh, act every decade or two, it seems like, like they're uh, threatening to cut the budget. If you have a chart that shows Title VI funding, on my website uh, at kurzman.unc.edu, and it's gone up and down over the uh, last 50 years. Let's fast forward 20 years. Act there is a presidential commission to look into foreign language and international studies. This is the Carter administration, and after 20 years of this National Defense Education Act, which had later changed names, the Higher Education Act, 20 years federal role in promoting international education. Uh, colleges and universities around the U.S., the Commission found a serious deterioration in this kind of language and research capacity. It's gotten worse, according to that, better after 20 years of federal efforts. This is a recurrent refrain. And what the, the, the rationale for why is this important? It's not just important in its own right that we should study the world or create global citizens or anything like that, cosmopolitan individuals. It's also Live in, according to this report, and you'll see at the bottom here, an increasingly hazardous international military, political, and economic environment. And Cold War now bringing in economics as well, the idea of global competitiveness. These have become the two and remain the two main themes for why we should be having international education in the U.S. One is to fight our enemies, and second is to compete with our competitors in the business and economic world. That's why we need to have be training people in all sorts of international and area studies. So 1979, let's jump ahead now. Decades, 2007, National Research Council does yet another review. Where are we? And the solution is equally dire. A pervasive lack of knowledge about foreign cultures and foreign languages, which, as you can imagine, threatens the security of the United States, as well as our ability to compete in the global marketplace. And here we have produced an informed citizen third part here, which is that it's just good. It's intellectually part of the mission of the universities and colleges and higher education and the education system in general to open people's minds to the world. So now this third trope should up here, ending international education because it's a good thing, not because it will lead to this success or national defense. The consistent sense of dismay and these repeat pick three, there have been dozens of reports in the area over the past century. There are always dire assessments. It's always a problem. And there's a professional self-interest involved here. I want to point out that I'm going to say something similar, <coughs> that we should be doing more. Uh, and you should dismiss that just as I'm dismissing these others on these same grounds. That those of us who work in this area and care about international education have interest, a clear self-interest in saying that it's a problem, the system is 
broken and we need to invest more money in it. That seems obvious. It's no external, there's no uh, external, whatever we would say, Archimedean point to assess these things by. The people who are interested enough to assess uh, national education are also the ones who benefit increased funding to it. So that, let's look at different that universities might be globalizing. I'm going to give an example from here in Chapel Hill, a uh, comparison of our state and small international center at Coates Hall uh, here at the University of North Carolina, where all of our international and area centers were uh, jam-packed in there for a number of years, for decades, and the brand new, wonderful uh, uh, global education center that was opened up uh, uh, several years ago, much more expensive, uh, a terrific new facility, universities clearly investing in global education. They clearly want the uh, our students to be exposed to more global material, to foreign languages, to, foreign, to study abroad, to all sorts of global experiences. Uh, and they've put them where their mouth is by uh, building this new book to house it, to be showcased for it. This is just one example. There are similar new global buildings at many universities and colleges uh, uh, around the United States. Uh, and I think this is part of a trend that, that universities are recognizing that having a global uh, uh, providing global experiences can be a branding mechanism for attracting students. It's an important and integral part of higher education on these campuses. So the challenge. It's a challenge to take an educational system and all of its different components and internationalize them. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, 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 it, you know, it's earning a big shift. It takes a long time. And I'm going to look at two uh, factors or two uh, uh, in which this is occurring. The first, because this is a library audience, I'll show you data on library collections, and then I'm going to turn to uh, the area that I'm focusing on for my own research, which is American social science. So global library collections. Uh, the, uh, this is the research data uh, from uh, OCLC's WorldCat. Uh, database. LC uh, was kind enough to share this massive chunk of an even more massive database that we all use and appreciate so much. Uh, WorldCat database then has uh, uh, records, bibliographic records on uh, apparently two billion uh, items. Uh, their current website uh, just posted two billion, uh, the two billionth item. Uh, fortunately, I did not have to swim through all of that data, and they pulled out for me an already overwhelming amount of data, 29 million records that were books uh, published between 1958 and 2010, and that were held at more than, at all of the academic libraries in the United States. So they didn't tell me we had which one, so I can't see like what our collection looks like. That's a pay service, and they do a great job. But I know how many libraries have them, according to the data they provided for me. And I hear publication and then all the other bibliographic things like subject headings, titles, author, and so on, place of publication. I don't know in this data the year that the book was acquired. So a book published in 1960, I'll be as though it was purchased in 1960 and cataloged in 1960, but because of otherwise. And that would be an extremely difficult thing to try to trace back, uh, although I think it would be an exciting project uh, in terms of um, uh, making the archive accessible with all of this, the, the growth and the, uh, of these records and of these collections over time. So we have 29 million records. Uh, as many of you know, we've worked with uh, these materials, and I am increasingly aware as I wade through it, uh, there can be multiple records for the same book. I find when my own work on Middle Eastern stuff that different translations will show up, and so the same book will have multiple records. Uh, there's a, you know, obviously there's going to be stuff missing that's not in any of these libraries. Uh, so it's not a perfect snapshot of all publications, but it's a fascinating and incredibly extensive uh, picture of library collections in the United States that is 
largest academic library collections in the United States. So uh, this chart looks at how international books have collected in the United States in academic libraries since 1960. The number is the year of publication, not the year of the acquisition. Uh, and the top line is the number of books published outside of the U.S. collected each year by at least one, and I don't know how many in this chart, we're not saying how many, Many. This is for records. How many books were published uh, were, that were published abroad were collected in at least one academic library in the U.S. in that year. The numbers are uh, rising steadily since 1960. 200,000 foreign books were collected each year to over 400,000 by the year 2000. Steady increase. What's also interesting here is since 2000. The stagnated. That is, the growth has stagnated. Now, it happened exactly in that year. If there's some national library budget crisis, or if somehow priorities were changing, if this has to do somehow with digital material being increasingly uh, collected, but this is suggests that the growth we'd seen for the previous four decades in internationalizing library collections that colleges and universities in the U.S., that growth stopped. And they're collecting as much material as years ago or a dozen years ago, but not more, which is disturbing. I off the numbers of 2007 because the uh, for material, there's delays in cataloging, and the numbers drop off sharply after 2007. And this data set that was a snapshot as of December or November 2011 uh, and so it didn't seem comparable. So, 2007. Now, it's possible that delays in logging also explain the lie since 2000. If there's stuff that's lying on cataloging shelves for a dozen years, perhaps, perhaps we can do a follow up and see then if the, if the rise continues, you know, when we date a snapshot two years later. There's for non English books. So, obviously, a lot of stuff published, say, in Britain or in the Netherlands or wherever is in English. So let's look at non-English books only. And there too, a rise over 40 years, stagnation since the year 1000. Now, how many libraries are collecting these books? Here, from 1960 up through the 70s, in the 70s and then since uh, in the 70s and 80s, and since 1990 approximately, Approximately over the last few years, few libraries have been buying international material. Or this way, international material is being bought by fewer libraries. This is the average number of libraries holding each international book. This is again the academic libraries and the only material that's been you know uploaded to uh, to WCAT. The decline is significant. So. Uh, for, for uh, foreign books, uh, almost seven libraries had the average book in 1990, and that's now five and a half libraries. Uh, it dropped off fairly quickly in, during the 90s. And non English language books, it was uh, almost five libraries in the average book in 1990, and that's down to three. So non English language books are held in fewer libraries. Now, Importantly, over this time period, there's also a rise in interlibrary borrowing. Uh, I know I'm a huge uh, abuser of that system. I get material all the time. I'm very uh, appreciative of that system. So perhaps we don't need foreign books everywhere. Of course, the rise of uh, digital access means that there's less of a need, perhaps, for lots of paper copies everywhere. And it's striking that fewer libraries at this time of globalization, fewer libraries uh, fewer books overall uh, abroad are being purchased by academic library in the U.S. And you see the, the number at the bottom. How many books are we talking about? 93 million books. That's the uh, uh, that's a lot of a lot of books. There's a huge trove of foreign material in U libraries. That's been growing, of course, every year. Another several hundred thousand books are bought, purchased, uh, and uh, uh, 
so that there is good news here, but there's also somewhat disturbing uh, news in these trends. The social sciences. I'm going to data sources. The first has to do with books, and the second is journal articles. Uh, and it's strange because the, the findings are not entirely consistent across the two uh, arenas. I have data on dissertations, but I haven't uh, uh, messier to work through, and I'm not finished doing that. To the book. So once again, OCLC data from WorldCat, and uh, we are looking at the social sciences only here, and I picked those out with call range, Library of Congress call numbers uh, from C through JZ. Uh, that's a very rough approximation uh, of the social sciences. It includes a bunch of material that some people might consider social science. Um, in any case, what we've done here is try to identify the subject matter of this book. What geographic region is it about? So obviously, the geographic region, uh, subject headings, the, which are uh, mark. Uh, codes 650Z and 651A, and then in addition, these federal codes for 651A that were uh, uh, layered onto the database by uh, the OCLC, and then an algorithm that went through all of those uh, and identified what part of the world they're about. And I'm happy about that algorithm. Uh, I've spent a lot of time developing it, and we are no MapQuest or Google, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, we did, a, I think, a decent job. With the books, we were able to identify about two-thirds of them as to what part of the world they're about. And it's funny, because not, it's not just geographic terms. We ended up using a bunch of terms. If we couldn't find a geographic word, if it didn't say, uh, uh, you know, uh, Don or, uh, um, uh, I don't know, Dar es Salaam, we would, if it says uh, uh, it's probably the United States. Uh, if it says desegregation, it's probably the United States. Uh, there's a bunch of words that through hand coding we realized were really just about the U.S. And so we took some of those, a small number of those, and said, if we see those, we'll say it's about the U.S. So, um, did all of the uh, 650s and 651As that we saw, about 12,000 different entries, some of them really amusingly inappropriate, you know, not graphic at all, but somebody, you know, took away uh, in the back room of some library in 1963, uh, typed in, you know, uh, I'm not going to give an example to make fun of anybody, things that were, were, were shouldn't have been in there. So myself and a team of research assistants went through all of those and made sure that we, if somebody hand code, some librarian uh, or publisher had entered that information into a geographic heading, so we were going to, we were going to add. And then we used those entries as well to try to capture from titles uh, and uh, other material, uh, as we we'll with the articles, to try to find what region of the world these are about. So we thought uh, that uh, sadly the unknown seemed to be increasing the base section at the top in recent years, which uh, shouldn't be. The, the, the records should be better and better. They relatively steady across this period. About two-thirds are getting identified. And as you can see, a large chunk of those are about the United States only. If it's about the U.S. and another region, we call it international. We're moving unknown. We see international-oriented uh, material in the social sciences, in books, from that are in this uh, World Cat catalog, have been somewhat since roughly 1970. So they're there now uh, about 60, 40%, about a third perhaps, of all books in the social sciences are on international subjects. But that only gets us back to where we were in the 60s. There's not been a huge sea change of globalizing the social sciences according to this metric. Of those books, uh, what regions of the world, if we look only at the international books, have there been shifts? So this among international oriented books, and we see in Europe, uh, these uh, lines are uh, lowest smooth uh, curves. That is, the annual data is 
relatively jumpy, goes up and down. So smooth those out with a technique called Lois smoothing. Uh, Western Europe, at the top there, predominates. So uh, uh, roughly of all internationally focused books in the social sciences over the last half century have been Western Europe. It is uh, something everybody would expect. Uh, it's not surprising. That has gone down slightly over fears. That is, the rest of the world has, uh, has increased. Uh, focus attention on the rest of the world outside of Western Europe has increased a bit, but not a huge amount. And Western Europe still leads the second most popular region, Latin America, by a considerable amount. So Latin America there is relatively flat, slightly down, but relatively flat at 14 or 13 percent of the international oriented items, and a bunch of regions down below, the rest of the world region. Uh, uh, rest of the world, ROTW, I've heard this referred to now as the Rottweilers. <laughs> and zoom in now on the Rottweilers, here's the rest of the world. We see these regions, uh, one worthy story here, a big trend, is the Middle East. So the Middle East, the red line, jumps from around 6% in 1960, double to around 12% in 2010. It has changed then significantly. I know this from my own experience in Middle East studies, that there's more of us. And there's more folks interested in us, and this is no surprise to anybody uh, that since 9/11 uh, there has been a massive influx of attention, not just in the social sciences, of course, but globally and in policy circles, trying to figure out what's going on in the Middle East. And with recent events, it doesn't seem to ever leave the headlines or leave uh, uh, discussion policy agenda in Washington and I'm guessing it's not going to leave academic circles either. Still, talking 12% of the international material, which was itself only a third of books. So this is a relatively small pie that's being sliced up. Look at regions. We would expect, for example, by the same token, that East Europe and Eurasia, which is you know, the former Union territories, would suffer then a corresponding decline. Decline. That's the green line uh, from uh, 10 and 11 percent over decades uh, since the end of the Cold War to around uh, seven and a half percent or eight percent. Uh, lost a third of their market share. If we can think about it in those terms, uh, but uh, and according to the these uh, smooth curves, are now the least popular region. Although these are you know, relatively small differences. So I wouldn't put too much stock in the rank order among these lines. Yes? I think that Asia. Too, so the question, the, the comment was that it's surprising that Asia has declined. If we look at East Asia, growth there, uh, that's the sort of uh, grayish line. Uh, and it started around 6.5% in the 60s and went up to 10% uh, in the 90s and has now declined to maybe 9%. Uh, I think possibly the difference between 9 and 10% are, are, are maybe negligible, but we haven't seen it shoot up the way Middle East studies have. I think that's, that's a, a, a very good option. And uh, with the push towards internationalization, uh, all of this is surprising how constant they are. You know, that the, the trend is there's been relatively little change. The exception of Middle East studies, which doubled, that are within a few percentage points of where they were 50 years ago. Food numbers, these books have been multiplying. Let me get that. These are percentages of all books or percentages of internationally focused books. Food numbers have been absolutely huge growth. We know more about foreign countries, we're studying them more, but the city of the United States and Western Europe, we're that more as well. One way to sort of optimistic it would be uh, to look at this is to say that the, the study of the rest of the world has kept pace with the growth in the study of the United States in the social sciences. The pessimistic way 
would be to say that we have not shifted our attention uh, percentage-wise uh, to globalize it in any significant way over this time period. Let's switch the data set. Articles. So the journal articles uh, came primarily from two sources. Uh, let me mention uh, that, that we identify which journals to look at uh, by taking the top 10 journals uh, in each field. And we used a metric, the uh, Web of Knowledge, Thomson Reuters Citation Impact Factor. Uh, say which, what are the top 10 journals in each field? It's, I'm a little uncomfortable using this as our, our sampling criterion. Uh, because, uh, it, we don't have the rankings for 1960. <laughs> we use current rankings. And of course, journals change and fields change over time, but they weren't doing this in 1960. The rankings are based only on journal citations, not on books. Uh, so fields that are book-oriented uh, and parts of fields that are book-oriented are underrepresented uh, because the book citations don't show up and don't count as much. Non-U.S. journals in there and non-U.S. citations, so it's not an uh, exclusively U.S. list. And we pulled out the U.S.-based journals, but not uh, couldn't. Uh, tangle US, non-U.S. based citations. A huge thing is that these rankings overrate journals that are related to science fields because there are so many more science journals in the database. So if they just, uh, you know, cite uh, what an example, I don't think it's in the sample today because I'm not presenting real studies, but if there's a, a or religion and psychology or religion and science, that gets a huge impact factor way out of uh, proportion to its actual importance in the field of early studies, as there's so many more science journals, and any time they cite it, that pushes up that journal's ranking. So it's an imperfect metric. We'll use this, and we used, uh, downloaded the titles and abstracts and whatever else we could get from two sources. First was ProQuest's IBSS, the International Bibliography of the Social Sciences, which ProQuest was kind enough to share with us for the project. So we have, uh, uh, I think, a million, roughly a million uh, our journal articles in that database. Uh, many have abstracts, but not all. Uh, um, uh, source, if that, for journals that were covered in that source, uh, it was JSTOR's Data for Research, uh, which, uh, as you all know, in the library world is a wonderful collaborative effort uh, to make, uh, make material and journal articles available. Uh, and they were kind enough also to allow us a, uh, to download large numbers of, of um, articles, uh, bibliographic information. So we have a database of about uh, 1.2 uh, million articles and a huge number of unknowns. So we put them through the same algorithm, and we were successful as we were with the books in identifying the geographic subject of these articles. So half overall. Fortunately, in more recent years, there's more abstracts, more text to look through, and we have a much greater success rate in recent years of identifying geographic regions. Trend, once again, is really little change. Internet items are focus of the identifiable material. The identifiable material, the non-identifiable material, I'm guessing, is largely U.S. If it say where it's about, it's probably about the U.S. Uh, international material is majority, but it increased over the last half century. Western Europe actually increasing its position in social science articles from 1% to 35% uh, in the 1980s and holding steady at that level ever since then. So over the last generation, Western Europe is more studied, it appears, than prior, prior uh, before that. Latin America, again, but dueling with South Asia as an interest. South Asia was not a major uh, uh, focus in the books, but appears to be more of a focus in the social science articles. And then again, kind of the zooming in, the bottom chart, we see the Middle East, consistent with the other chart, jumping, uh, almost doubling in its attention. East uh, Asia, again, uh, uh, swooping with a recent decline. 
Eastern Europe, consistent with the books, uh, also declining somewhat in its position in these articles. Conclusion, I'd like to draw your attention to a project, a task force being led by Deborah J. Jacobs at the Duke University Library and funded by the Mellon Foundation uh, and working in conjunction with the Center for Research Libraries and their Global Resources Network and to promote the internationalization of U.S. higher education and bringing together scholars and librarians and others to try to attention to these challenges and to see what we can do by, by working together. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, it's relatively rare uh, experience uh, for scholars to have much to do with librarians, uh, and yet we are, you know, very uh, reliant on each other uh, in this project to, uh, in all areas, of course, but especially in this project to, to internationalize and globalize uh, universities. There's a task force report that's coming uh, this spring. Uh, I was uh, honored to be part of this task force, uh, and it offers a series of suggestions and ways forward, uh, both for collaboration uh, and for uh, changing and internationalizing uh, or promoting internationalization on campus. I've got a short address listed up here. It's quite a long address uh, at the Center for Research Libraries, the actual report, and I'm hoping we'll have a web page up that can be a sort of uh, um, a destination location for people who are interested in, in this. If you would like to be part of this, uh, those of you in the room and those of you, uh, if there is anybody out there in cyberspace, uh, please, uh, please do get in touch. Uh, my email is kersman at unc.edu. My web address is kersman.unc.edu. Happy to be in touch with people, uh, and I'm sure that uh, speak for my colleagues on this task force that they would as well uh, as we try to figure out how to, uh, how to uh, continue trends and, and how to uh, make sure that uh, the libraries keep pace with globalization uh, throughout the rest of the world and the university and higher education more generally do as well. Happy to spend time uh, with your comments and questions. Thank you all. Please. I wonder if the trend in Asia has to do with the fact that they are more advanced in the digital material. That's a question. In fact, that's a question for. Uh, let me repeat the question first, in case the phone didn't pick it up here. Uh, the question is whether the trend um, in uh, East Asian materials may be due to the fact that they're more advanced in, in digital materials, and so it wouldn't show up necessarily in this book base. Or uh, uh, the journal articles, the subject of journal articles as well. Sure, uh, that could be. There, when we break out the library collection stuff by region, uh, East Asia, uh, I think, shows a slightly higher rate of growth than it did in the social science attention chart. Uh, we pull books as well by uh, publication, uh, and and uh, they are definitely ahead of almost every region of the world, with the exception of the United States uh, and Western Europe. Uh, so there definitely is more material out there, it seems, in digital form. Uh, I think they're changing in some ways, because the rest of the world may be catching up. No, you know? Not in America? I don't know. Uh, I think that, that, that there's, there's um, the trend towards digital material is so topsy, you know, it's, it's going topsy-turvy. It's, it's hard to know even what's out there. And a lot of this material, as you know, is not going through library channels. Right? People are just putting stuff up. Uh, and uh, that's true in, in uh, my home field of Middle East studies. Uh, huge collections of digitized books, uh, you know, copyright dam uh, that people have just scanned and put on, online uh, that are never going to be part of a library collection. Be, I mean, or there's never going to be enough to link to it because of copyright issues. Uh, people rely on that now. Uh, they know to go to it. And uh, so I, whether the library counts are a true 
snapshot of, of, of what's out there. Uh, of course, huge changes in what counts as source material. So having it be in a printed book is longer the dominant, ah, no longer the dominant or the, the main form uh, for information, uh, primary resource material, or even analyses. There's no counts that I know that I believe, uh, believe in, uh, no metrics for the digital reports. You know, so a, a, a think tank that puts the report online. There, there's tons of stuff like that that are making it into the academic work as citations, but going through the traditional channels, either as books or as journal articles. It's this whole other genre now. Interesting to do a study, actually, of, of citations to see, uh, the, to, to track the growth of these other forms of source materials. You see, you know, it's now common to see URLs in footnotes. Uh, and, and that, of course, didn't occur 20 years ago. Uh, what it's replacing is, is a book or an article, or it's replacing archival material or other sorts of things that we're also not going through libraries in the same way in a previous generation. Uh, this study depended on um, the graphic terms. Uh, for library collections, we can look at what the libraries are collecting based on language, and uh, I showed you the non-English curve. Uh, and we've, as you know, we've pulled that out with, by different languages. Uh, so the uh, focusing on uh, uh, Middle Eastern languages, for example, we can see the rise in Arabic language collections in the academic libraries, uh, startling increase uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, the um, from the of social science materials, with a series of keywords, we started with uh, the amazing data source uh, called the Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names, which has a million place names and alternate spellings, and it's hierarchical by you know, country and region. And the problem is that almost every word in the English language is a place name somewhere. We had huge numbers of false positives where we were <laughs> Identifying uh, you know, something, uh, uh, a place called San or a place called the or a place called whatever, and, and we were, it was, uh, it was, so an, an example would be a reunion. The word reunion is also reunion, is, is a place. So that's a, an example of all positive. So we can't skip back on that and just went with country names and big cities. And the eponyms that we went with, um, which are often languages as well. So uh, if um, uh, Belgium and Belgian, for example, we made sure we also had Flemish and Anders in there. Didn't want a list of a million place names, so we started with a list of what ended up being a couple thousand place names and demonyms, added in ethnic groups from a database of, uh, of ethnic groups around the world. Uh, and then hand coded all of those 651, 650Zs, and 651As. And that was then, as I said, about 12,000 uh, geographic indicators. I didn't want to go much further than that because of the problem of false positives. But we may go through and sample. Uh, we did some hand sampling of the things we couldn't identify. And uh, some of them are, you know, like a psychology experiment. It just said, you know, there were 30 subjects in this study. And we thought that those 30 subjects were undergraduates at the home university of the lead author. It doesn't say that. So we tell a computer to know that. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that we suspect in the unknowns are really U.S. Uh, if it's about the rest of the world, they'll probably tell us. Then is the unmarked category. Considered using just a some image or even all the unknowns to the U.S. and seeing how that affects the trend. Uh, it would be for the uh, because the journal articles we got better at identifying them or more were identified. 
as fewer unknowns. And if they're all you, if all the unknowns are U.S., then international is doing pretty well uh, for journal articles in recent years. Or, uh, I'm not sure if I would be able to get that past peer review. Question in the back here. I struggled with the findings here because it doesn't tell the clear story that I expected to find. I thought we would see rise in globalization and a spread of scholarly attention to more and more regions over a few years' time. So my general impression is that when I was in graduate school you know, a century ago, that uh, you know, it was unusual to study my department home to field of sociology. Uh, to study the Middle East was really unusual. And now there's the Middle East sociology working group, where it's quite common to see people working in this area. And I thought that would be reflected. It turns out in the, in the data that it is reflected for the Middle East, but not for uh, all regions of the world. So the the, the story that, that I took away from this, uh, I think, is, is stasis. That after 50 years of attention to global globalizing higher education and global scholarship and understanding the rest of the world, the picture is pretty similar now to what it was in 1960. Uh, and that that's a problem. It's a problem because we are uh, not fulfilling our mandate in the social sciences and not fulfilling our mandate in higher education more generally. If we continue to focus the, the, the majority of our energies on studying the United States and neglect uh, the rest of the world, and if our Western, the rest of the world focus is, is so heavily focused on Western Europe. Maybe Europe. So how do we... Yeah. Point. The, the, the comment is perhaps the level we have now is adequate. Uh, why should we push for, for, for more perhaps? Uh, is it a problem? Yeah. These numbers are problems. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to no, understand. It, 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 I think, uh, so the question is, is there a way to tell if there's a problem other than these numbers? Uh, I would say yes, that there are uh, a number of ways, uh, uh, assessments, of uh, uh, international education, say, for what our undergraduates are getting, which is one of the products of this. If we take these numbers as a proxy for which the faculty uh, in social sciences in the U.S. are focusing on the rest of the world, and if we take that as a proxy for what they're teaching, uh, it matches what we're seeing at the undergraduate level, which is that uh, a large number of our undergraduates are able to get through a college education without learning much about the rest of the world. If we <clears throat> at, at textbooks, for example, in a variety of fields, uh, there's a huge focus on the on the United States. There's of course a focus in Western Europe somewhat. Uh, the rest of the world gets brought in, uh, you know, sort of on occasion uh, as a satellite, uh, and that that's a, that's a problem. It's not uh, it's not giving our students what they need to get uh, as cosmopolitan. Uh, citizens of the world. Uh, I think it's a problem for the social sciences because when you sample uh, only this one portion uh, of the world's population and focus so extensively on this small subset, uh, have no idea if what you're finding is is a universal finding or if it's specific to this subset. So there's a beginnings of the push for cross-cultural work in psychology, for example, uh, 
Uh, and in sociology, the, those of us doing this kind of work have argued for years that the study of, say, social movements and protest movements, which grew up to study the U.S., needs to globalize because otherwise the scope conditions of the findings are so limited. Uh, what do in other institutional settings, in authoritarian settings? What happens with social movements in different cultural settings? Uh, all of those speak to the very questions the fields are trying to raise themselves. So it's a problem for a scholarship, and it's a problem for our students, I believe, that have shifted more over the last 50 years. Yes, I hope that you're finding that um, materials from Africa are the same since 1950 until maybe recent, but I see that So the question is, uh, why we haven't seen uh, growth in Africa-related uh, material, uh, this is the way we've seen a growth in, in Middle East-related material, that there's been plenty of conflict and war and so on in Africa, uh, and yet it doesn't need to be reflected in uh, library collections or in scholarly attention. I think that's a, a, a very good question, and I think that it is, um, it, it reflects that if the norm is non-changing, as we've seen, uh, that at least percentage-wise, all of these are growing in absolute terms, but not in percentage terms. I think that's sort of one of the big things here. Uh, but that there's that they, the attention to regions seems to, where there is change, it seems to follow public policy attention. So the Middle East is obviously of great interest to U.S. Uh, publics and to U.S. policymakers, and I think that is what we're seeing uh, you know, why we're seeing this change in the Middle East. Uh, it has not been uh, of great interest to policymakers. It's not on the public agenda much. And so, I, I mean, I think that there's a big push to change things. So the, the Cold War, and we see Eastern Europe come down a bit. Uh, the rise of attention in Middle East wars, U.S. involvement, uh, we see uh, a, a rise in, in, uh, uh, in that. There's just happened that level of public attention. I think the scholarship follows the public attention to some extent in that limited way. If that's, that's my, my, I mean, that fits the data. Um, not only, for example, we could look at after the, the Vietnam War, did attention to Southeast Asia drop? Uh, and so that's something we would want. The numbers there would be really a tiny, very small baseline, but it would be worth exploring. Whether all wars, uh, U.S. wars, tend to drive scholarship uh, or, or not. So the, the point is, if we disaggregated Africa uh, into subregions or countries, we might see uh, different patterns. I should mention North Africa is in the Middle East region uh, for our purposes. Uh, we could, we have, for many of these records, identified the country or the primary country fo of focus. So we could look at specific countries. The numbers get so small that there's a huge amount of jumpiness from year to year. Uh, we could, of course, aggregate them by decade or something as well. Uh, I suspect that we're, we're, we're talking about relatively small numbers of books on any part of Africa or articles on any part of Africa uh, compared to, you know, the, the study of the U.S. and the, the study of the U.K. and France. That's what you were saying about the research following the policy. We would do something in the 90s with HIV, AIDS, and health policy. That could be. Again, I'm looking only at the call ranges C through okay. Jack. So that might show up in a different call range, uh, and it would also possibly be different articles, uh, different journals. Uh, but I think, and it would be interesting to do a global type project of all scholarship. Uh, enough trouble with the scale of data already, but uh, I could imagine working with a computer scientist and a team of people. <laughs> that would be fascinating to see to what extent public issues uh, fit into scholarly work, uh, or in the other way around where scholarly work drives part of the public agenda as well. And we could look at news stories and congressional hearings and so on as a marker of public interest uh, to see how these things, that would be a truly big data approach. So if you look at non-scholarly research, you're saying that you're not going to 
The question whether we've looked at non-geographically based clusters, uh, such as the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, these rising powers. We did not. Uh, and I think that would be an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. Of course, Russia is complicated because under the Soviet times, that was a major focus for a totally different reason. Uh, but we could take perhaps the post-Cold War period and look at just that period to see whether those countries compare to other countries. Uh, that would be an interesting project. The, there's a huge amount of lag time in all, all of this. Uh, if we take what does it take to become an expert on a region, or at least to feel that you have enough expertise to write about a region, uh, you know, the, the time it takes to learn the languages, to go to the graduate school, graduate study, to you know, move into a to, to, and there's all sorts of, uh, and all the availability of data. I mean, there are parts of the world that don't get studied in the social sciences because you can't get access to them or because there's no data, there's no surveys, there's no whatever. Uh, and that's a, a huge problem as well. Yeah, okay, the, the countries with surveys are better studied. The countries with censuses that are made public are better studied. And that reflects it's not a, it's an endogenous issue because those are countries then that are, uh, for whatever reason, open to this kind of work. They probably have, are producing their own scholars, they're sending their own scholars abroad for training, so we're going to get them in our graduate programs, they may publish in our journals. Uh, these things are probably related. Uh, so it's not just national security issues that are driving these things, it's also the demography and population of scholars. We have difficulty trying to map that, try to get access, for example, to demographics and national origin of scholars. Um, data is collected, but for, for reasons they won't share uh, from the National Science Foundation, or at least not easily. Uh, the, the, the comment is that perhaps for Latin America in particular, that the number of titles uh, it, it reflects trends uh, in part because of smaller print runs of publications in the region, and in part because of collaborative agreements among libraries in the U.S. where not everybody is trying to collect everything, and I think that is true. And with the rise of, of interlibrary borrowing and uh, collaborative agreements like our TERLN here in the, the North Carolina, that we're seeing the material up to some extent so we can get more, but fewer places will have each item. And I think that's probably, and as we've seen also, uh, the growth in collections in absolute numbers, uh, you know, storage becomes an issue, uh, and, and there's good reasons to try to collaborate, and so that number might be going down for those reasons. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's probably true. Uh, my interest is to make sure that we're, we're continuing to collect and make available as much can of what's out, out there. We, we don't even have a picture of what's out there that's not in these collections, right? There's, there's tiny, uh, small-scale investigations that suggest that publications from small publishers and ephemera and other sorts of things may not get into any library collection in the U.S. Uh, and a problem, it seems to me, a problem whose dimensions we don't even know. Another problem, it seems to me, is that a lot of the libraries of the world are not uh, yet on WorldCat. So at least uh, you know, very few libraries are participating uh, in that. They're not to do that. I'm hoping that as WorldCat, as the OCLC grows, and as technological um, uh, capabilities spread, that we'll be able to find out that perhaps there's a lot of material that's only held locally, uh, and that perhaps we can force uh, collaborative arrangements across national borders to make material available on a scale that we haven't been able to in the past. Uh, one of the suggestions, that's one of the suggestions of this task force uh, that we're hoping to act on would be to forge international agreements, perhaps to have to 
to share the technologies that we have here for, say, uh, places where they haven't brought their catalog online or it's not uh, compatible yet with the standards that uh, the, the OCLC has uh, and find out what's out there. Uh, and then, of course, with digitization, uh, now the capabilities are far greater to be able to share material digitally, uh, not have to you know, send the actual paper copies across, uh, across the world. One of the uh, uh, experiments in this area that I was really uh, taken with that came up in our task force work is called can release methods of Chin, where uh, a library that has the resources in the U.S., and these are still relatively small scale, but it's still a bit fascinating, go to some region, and usually grant funded, uh, and works with local librarians to collect as much material as possible locally that had never made it to American collections before, uh, oh, and maybe in their collection, digitize it and leave the hard copy for the local library. So they have the collection out of it, a collection that's been cataloged and, and processed uh, you know, to, to, to global standards. And uh, the, the collecting library in the U.S. also gets uh, the collection. Uh, that's a really nifty model. And even if you didn't digitize it all, just having it cataloged would be used to know that it's there. So that it perhaps demand it might be digitized. Uh, when somebody says they need that or uh, for their for their work, yes, uh, that's just one among many of these sort of experimental types of ways forward to help globalize library collections. And I'm hoping that as those libraries globalize, that will help lead the way then for my field, in biology, and the rest of the social sciences to continue to globalize uh, as well. Uh, at the end of the hour, thank you all uh, for showing up in person and, and on the web, and thanks again to the OCLC for arranging this.